Thank you very much. I should not say this before starting a talk, but I just finished the slides, so I really hope that there is, <laughs> there is everything good. Yeah, so uh, C++ in a Python conference, I know for some of you this might be confusing, but for some of you it's important and you understand uh, the goal of this talk. So by the end of this talk, I just want to, uh, maybe it's a spoiler, but I just want to understand that it's really nice to embrace other languages and even some languages that we believe that are too old, too complicated, or whatever other reason you have. Uh, if I were to summary this talk in, in one phrase, it will be mostly this one, which is extending Python, which is something that most of you here, I know many faces here already know what to do, and it's something that we can do because, of course, uh, C API in Python, really important. But then just as a show of hands, uh, how many people will write an extension now? Uh, oh, by the way, yeah, really cool documentation. Uh, in Rust today, if you were to, to write a, a new module for Python that will revolutionize, how many people will use Rust to do this? A few hands. Okay, how many people will use C++? <laughs> Less hands. How many people will use SIG? Okay, two, well, still. So it was a good progression of uh, languages. Uh, it's fine. I mean, I will not tell you here that one language is better than the other. You choose whatever you like. I'm just here to tell you that some languages that are maybe people is afraid of, they're not so terrible. So uh, we need to talk about surveys and indexes. This is a topic that I hope that it will not go a lot of time. But uh, if you look at, you know, Stack Overflow, for example, if these are the professional developers, like ranking of languages, if we keep aside all the front end or databases, we do have Python there, yay. But then we have Java, C Sharp, C++, PHP, C, Go, whatever, and Rust uh, there at the bottom, which is like, mm, okay, well, people like it, but professionally it seems like Still not there. This is a complicated graph to see, but it's the use and the desire of using it. So there you can see how Rust really shines. Like a lot of people want to use it, but not many people is using it, right? But if you go you know, like different index, we can go the Tiobe, Tiobe, I don't know how to pronounce the Tiobe index. And in a, lot, a long time, C++ for the first time went over C. And this is an index that is based on professional developers looking for information on different search engines and stuff. And you see that now we have Python and C++ together. So I know surveys are super subjective because the, the, the amount of people doing it is different and it's just to get an idea. But what this reflects is something that I learned and it took me some time to learn because I was like super like, oh yeah, Python everywhere, whatever. But the world kind of runs on C and C++ still. Even if we like other languages, even if you are like super hyped by the new things or whatever, still need that. So I know what everyone is doing internally at the moment, you know, like just fear immediately. But I just want to present in this talk really lightly that uh, C++ is way closer than Python that you think. Uh, so TensorFlow, everyone knows us and use it. You can see there the percentage of all C++ that we have there. PyTorch, similar thing. Ray, similar thing, SciPy as well, NumPy. And then, as you see, that many projects that you're familiar with, of course, you are using without touching the code, you're using C++ as they need. So it's something that I believe that should be important for you to at least to grasp or at least to get an idea of what's going on there and not get um, scared. So yeah, as I told you before, C++ has a bad reputation of being a difficult language, right? So just as a comparison, I like this example because it usually gives people hope. <laughs> uh, if you have this super simple, badly programmed Python class there, and I want to show you now the counterpart of the C++ implementation, and you look at it for a little bit, uh, you have extra curly brackets here and there, some semicolons, but is it that hard to understand? Of course, you hide the Python reference, right? So you, it's kind of cheating, but is it that hard? I don't think so, right? So you do have some so proximity. You need to learn a few quirks and stuff, but it's not so far away, right? So there are many things in C++ that I would not want to bore you, but I will just highlight. The, the, there are features that are really cool. So for example, in C++, since many versions ago, now you can use the word, the keyword auto, then, then you, don't, you don't worry about the type. So kind of like Python, but with this extra word there. So then you have an int, a float, some weird character, uh, structure that we don't need to talk about, strings and stuff. Uh, the same with ranges. 
I mean, if, you're, if you like Python 4, you have this thing there. So 4, yeah, you have an iterable i and then values, simple. If you have something a little bit more like uh, complicated, but still you can have something closer to the enumerate that sometimes we do with dictionaries, iteration and stuff. And I know there are many semicolons and other characters there, but still, you, I'm pretty sure that you can grasp this thing. And last but not least, this is one of the features that was really like cheered by the whole C++ community, is that finally they decided to have a print function. Uh, I was inspired in many other uh, languages, of course, as one of those, as an example, it's Python, because this really sounds like the dot .format approach that we have for strings. Good. So still, with these examples, who thinks Python is simpler than C++? Good, I will remember all your faces because now we have a quiz. So now, for some people here, and I really like to show this snippet because there's always new people in the room that don't know the similar talks. That's like, for some people, this expression is super complicated. For some people, no. Do you understand? It's like, oops, a lambda function, whatever you receive, and a couple of arguments, you do something, right? Everyone is there, like, so far, yeah, right? This. Also, some people know it already. Hope people, I, I will not ask you, don't worry, but who is not familiar with it? I was not familiar with so many. Okay, this is the valid Python code. You can try it afterward. This, it's super simple, but it's super weird, right? I, I, I really liked your, your, your sincerity. This, this is valid Python code. Who is not, who doesn't know what this means? Okay, lots of hands as well. This is Python code. It's a valid sequence of Python code. This is Python code as well. So I'm not doing any weird, I am not overloading things, I'm not playing this time of like having my own interpreter. This is vanilla Python. So if you try it out, you can figure out what it does. And this, no, this is not Python. This is Pith. This is a goat golfing language, but that's another top, a topic for another talk. If you are interested, you can read that. So, a language can be both simple and complicated. Please don't that not like uh, make a battle rotations for languages because they are more things and have more features around, whatever. Everything can be complicated, even Python. And I hope that you kind of understand or believe me when I tell you when I show you this piece of code. So yeah, but this talk is about Qt, right? So Qt, or some people say Qt, it's a framework that is super old and it's super, it's almost around the same age as Python. And if you have remember or try to remember the first version of Python that you use uh, and see how Python is at the moment, you can see the whole evolution is the same with any other kind of piece of software. So it's imagine the, a, a, a lot of things like change quite a lot there. So at the beginning, Qt it was uh, thought to be to solve a problem of having something, a framework to create UIs cross-platform because there back then you had like different options, but it was you have code that kind of is the same code in each platform and you can have something about it. When I say batteries include, these are the essential modules for the Qt framework. We just said, we'll say it doesn't make much sense for you, maybe network, widget, test, whatever. But when I tell you batteries include, these are the add-ons of the Qt framework. So here are all the modules that at least we have. Some of them are not available in Python, but that's a thing. But you can see that kind of fields, whatever we have with Python with the standard library, like lots of modules to do that, because we need to understand it's a different language. They, C++ don't have all the amazing modules that we have. So Qt kind of like wanted to provide all the things that C++ developers didn't have. So that's why they start adding more and more, even in the latest version, we add a few more modules as well. Yeah, but now we're talking about Qt, but we're in the your Python uh, conference, right? Yeah, but the good news, as I told you already, is that there are Python bindings for Qt. And there is another, maybe, I guess, like 80% of the room, if you know Accenture, they will say, yeah, PyQt. This talk is not about PyQt. It's about PySide. There are different modules. What? Why? Yeah, because licensing is complicated. So PyQt was first. I cannot reject that idea because it's a fact. And they have their own license. The Qt project has LGPL, and they decided to have GPL, and they are developed by different companies. So one is by the Qt company, where I work, and the other one is by Riverbank Computing, which has been having PyQt since Qt version 3 or something like that. Yeah, I agree. And uh, platforms, the same. Support for other kind of deployment and Android, the same. And I know I'm biased because I work there and I am one of the developers of PySite, but this now following slides is to show you that we at the Qt for Python, the PySite, we try to do a little bit more. 
And this will be only a few examples. And we are doing fine with the time, I think, yes. 10 minutes. Uh, so what's and more that I was showing there? So once you install the tool, whatever, you will discover that there are many features that come around that are not only the Qt API that most of you are familiar with. This is another maybe a good question that you should have asked before. How many people have used Qt? I don't care which version, which language, whatever. Good, nice. So you know the Qt API. So you know that what to expect, like bare minimum things to expect. So one of the things that we did is because we were trying to be a little bit anarchist there, like I said, we will break Qt API compatibility, and then we started to think, what, what can we do from the Python point of view uh, in order to enable other projects? So the only example that comes to mind is, for example, there is a project called PyQt Graph, even though PyQt is in the name, it's also worked with PySite. And they needed a special API, a special function to draw some points because they, are, they were doing some graphing or plotting, whatever. And they asked us, like, can you add this new function to receive this specific data type? And we said, sure. So we added. And this might sound silly, might sound simple, but I believe that it's a really good uh, um, uh, first step in order to somehow embrace the Python ecosystem because we didn't want it to be only the bindings for Qt uh, in Python. And this is at least the, what I still believe that we want to have as a difference. I do respect by Qt and whatever they want to do because they want to be a one-on-one -on -one API thing, but we wanted to do things differently. So this is one of the things that we do. The other one was NumPy support. So we noticed that in the Qt API, there are many places where you have vectors of something or whatever other structured sequences. So we thought, yeah, maybe we can support, I don't know, NumPy arrays. People is doing things like that. So then we decided to add NumPy support for some, well, most of the signatures that receive a sequence. And this is something that you also can interact with, which I believe is nice. Who here uses NumPy? Yeah, or have been using it? Okay, see, convenient for you as well. Um, Tooling, this is an also an interesting topic. I know there's a lot of nice tools all over the place. And uh, we wanted to help people starting projects, for example, with PySet uh, 6 projects to create new projects, run, compile some resource files, whatever. Then have deployment. This is something that it might take a little bit of time, but that's a simple Tetrix tool that is written with uh, PySet and Qt, and we can compile it with PySet 6 uh, deploy. And then after that, it will be a little bit longer, maybe I will cut it, but believe me, after this step, we will generate um, a binary file with a tool, again, not something that we reinvent from scratch. We decided to use something outside, so no PyInstaller, no CXFix, but Nuitka, which is a really good project, I think it is the only one that, you can correct me maybe later, is the only deployment tool that does not freeze your Python project, but transform your Python code in a C extension and then compile the C extension and generate a real binary. If you didn't know it, kudos for them, but we use it under the hoods in order to have this kind of behavior. And this will finish, I still have some time. And then when we execute it, we can rush a little bit more. Oh no, there's one more thing. Okay, it's a slow process, I know, but it works. I can show you later if you want. Another one that even one of the most uh, kind of like alive or young UI frameworks in Python criticize is that for example, maybe you know Beware, uh, Toga. They criticize as most of the UI frameworks that we have in Python, they have APIs that's filled and they smell C++, right? So this is some random C++-ish uh, C++ code that you can have in Qt and Python. But we implemented something called feature that in order when you enable it, we get rid of all the camel case API, we transform it to snake case APIs, we get rid of all the setters and getters, and you can access the property right away. So I believe that this was a really good thing because every time that I was going to a conference, people was criticizing the, the thing because of that feature. We are, I think, they are the, one of the largest projects that support PyPy, so that if that's your thing, we do support us since many versions ago. We have been doing a lot of things on ARM64. I remember when they announced the whole universal binaries, whatever, we did that. We had uh, the wheels for Python, uh, for M something, the uh, processors. We started to do some packaging for ARC64 Linux, and now we are, even if we like it or not, research on Windows ARM64 as well. So we are trying to get there because it's something to enable more people to use it. <clears throat> Now, uh, another thing that we were lacking compared to PyQt was Android compatibility. Some people still believe like PySci2 they didn't support anything, um, didn't have enough support. So thanks to my, my, my colleague Cham that is there in the third row, uh, we have now Android support. So you can write PySci, uh, the tool is for just deploying the code and then you have it. I mean, you need to have the wheels, but this is something that we solve. 
and you have an Android application running uh, there. That's, and again, we didn't do everything from scratch because we are super hackers or anything. We rely on another project, Kiwi. Kiwi is doing a lot of work on that. You know Kiwi for sure. And they have the Python for Android project. It's an open source project, and we said, hey, why are you doing something again? Let's use that project. So then she managed to submit some, some patches to that, contribute to that, and then, you know, two projects, we kind of want to achieve the same thing, and now thanks to them, we do have Android support. Uh, what about other UI frameworks? I will go quickly here, because I still, I know I still have 15 minutes. Um, I told you already about Kiwi. I want to be transparent. I know I work in the Qt company, I develop PySight, but I want you to try the other frameworks out there because I want you to experience and judge which one is more fitted for your functionality. So for example, this is an ex uh, a simple application in Kiwi. Uh, Kiwi also has support for Android, iOS, Linux, Mac, and Windows, it's MIT. They also recently, maybe you have heard of Flit, which is uh, for writing Flutter applications. So you can also now write Python that gets I think somehow into Dart and then I don't know how they do it, maybe transpile, I don't know. Uh, but you can use it as well. I have seen it's super popular among beginners because they see this modern looking interfaces. Oh, I want something like that. Uh, Toga, which was already mentioned from the Beware project, um, they have been a, a around for, for some time now, but it's still an early stage UI framework. They claim it, it's not my words. And I put a little star there because I do know that at least there is a lot of uh, effort and a lot of interest of people working with Toga and Beware to maybe have those interfaces now on some WebAssembly application running somewhere. At least there are proof of concept that work, but it's also interesting. If you're into WebAssembly, maybe you can look this project. And just for comparison, I just put there PySight 6 with a little label that just says hello, nothing too fancy, but for you to get an idea of the code, because I really wanted, didn't want it to show a lot of code during this talk. Uh, and again, licenses are important in case that's your thing. A more technical topic that I think that I will not have enough time to talk about, uh, but I still wanted to present it to you, is the generation, the generation of the binding. So it's not as simple as well, it depends on what you use, but if you want to do everything from scratch, it's not as simple as saying something like, oh yeah, whatever you are calling this function in Python, call it in C++, because you need to do this for hundreds and hundreds of classes and methods and everything. So it's more complicated than that. In a nutshell, this binding generation thing is that you have some code, you have some whatever, and then you have the Python package, right? If you're going to go into more details, for example, what we do, it's something more like this. So we do have some tool that goes into the Qt C++ implementation, scrap all the headers, gets the idea of all the modules, classes, methods, arguments, whatever, whatever, complement that with some decisions from the Python point of view, because if you know C++, you know there are many types that, what are those types in C++? Yeah. For a vector, you can say, maybe an NumPy array, a list, maybe a tuple, I don't know. If you have, an, I don't know, sets or maps, you kind of also have the same things, but I always give this example for the people that know C or C++, what is a void star pointer in Python? There's no way to start point. Well, maybe there is some obscure thing that there is, but there is no, as far as I know. So you need to make this decision, you need to make these changes. Compiling Qt takes a lot of time, even in modern computers. So imagine now you need to kind of parse the whole thing, put it somewhere, generate some code, compile that, so it's a beast. The project is super launched, and this process is simple, but it takes a lot of time. So a couple of examples of what you can do with Qt. I didn't, as I said, didn't want to show a lot of code, but more, more like examples so you can feel more attracted to maybe to give it a try. Uh, the first one I wanted to even start with something that is not developed by Qt, and it's not developed by me, but I believe that is a really cool project, that is PyBind 11. Um, maybe you have heard about PyBind 11, who have heard, not used, heard, okay? Lots of hands. Um, the approach that they have is something that is quite useful when you have small example like this one, because you have like a little thing that you need to put in your code, and then with some magical compiling uh, command line, you get the final Python module. Cool, right? The problem that we had with Qt, that was our suspense, is that we, we didn't want it to go into each source files of the Qt framework, because there are many, and put these little things there for the module. Right? We don't want to bother other people. We want to extract information and do some own things. So as good uh, computer scientists or programmers, you can make call it that both ways, the team, the initial team, thought, hmm, maybe we need to write our own tool. So they decided to write Shiboken. So Shiboken is something that is heavily inspired in Boost Python, if you know that thing. Um, and again, it's a similar idea. Here you have the same code, but you don't need to touch 
You don't need to attach neither the C++ code nor the headers. So you can have those things somewhere, but you have this XML file that then you will say, hey, by the way, I want to create something that will come from here. You pass some CMake magic. We will not talk about CMake. Don't worry. We don't have enough hours for that. And uh, then magically it will work. So you didn't attach the original code. Maybe something that's unique or you like, your call. So there, as I told before, there are many other options for this thing. Uh, Swig, if you ever use Swig, uh, you know that it can be very complicated to understand the generated code. At least it's the binaries are huge. It's like Boost Python. It's full with things when you generate things. And uh, the C++ code is also a bit, a bit like a not easy to follow, in my opinion. Um, there is also SIP. Which zip will be kind of like the Shiboken that PyQt has, not PySide. They also have their own binding generator because I think that they also found the same difficulties that we found. And the last but not least, there is Nanobind, which is by the same person that, well, kind of person's idea, but lots of people contribute, uh, that wrote uh, PyBind 11. It's a new thing, so the person in charge wanted to uh, get better results into binary size, which is a thing, performance, compiling time, and so on and so forth. So yeah, if you want to give it a try, they are really cool. I mean, at least the last one is super cool. Maybe you can just check it out. So a few technical details about the, the Qt for Python project that I promise you again, super high level. So the first one is that we are, um, we are using the Python uh, limited API. And this is something that is super interesting. Last year, I was really lucky to, to give a talk about this topic. Uh, it's a dense topic if you are into more like fancy Python things going on, but it's an interesting thing. And since likely this year, I don't need to talk about much about it because there will be a nice talk by Victor Steiner that maybe you can watch. I think this is tomorrow, if I'm not incorrect. Uh, it's very interesting to that, but in a nutshell and super like high level thing is that you will have um, less uh, no, no dependency with some specific Python version. Maybe you have seen, for example, that NumPy generates when you go to pypi.org NumPy. You have the NumPy package for Python 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, the event, and then for Mac, and then for Windows, boom, and then for Arctic, whatever. So they have like lots of wheel, which is really hard, and then you have like big uh, project size in, in PyPI in general. So this kind of helps with that, but the other thing is that you don't need to have a lot of conditions depending on some specific version. So tomorrow there's a new fancy C API in Python that you want to use, but if it's not in the limit API, you don't need to. So just to be compatible and not have your code full of like, oh, if this version use this, if this version use whatever, whatever. And the release overhead, as I told you, is because if you need to have like hundreds of wheels or whatever to, to publish, will be really problematic. Build system and packaging, again, it could be a full talk on this thing. It's a sad experience so far, but it's something that works. Uh, it's complicated because I told you already all these com like weird C++ header parser things. We need to somehow fake some new package to generate. So the build system at the moment and the packaging is a mix of CMake, some custom Python script, but at least we have some stuff in PyProject.toml. So please use it because it's a really cool thing. But still, for extensions, it's a little bit uh, uh, painful. But for that topic as well, I believe that the talks by uh, Henry, he has been a speaker in many conferences, maybe you have seen it. I couldn't find a video of this year's PyCon, but hopefully soon will be around. Uh, he also contributes to PyBand 11, to Scikit-Build. If you're interested in this topic, I really invite you to watch these talks. They're really informative, can be a bit dense because it's you know hardcore building systems, C++ and all these things. But in a way, super recommend. At least I watch and I enjoy it. So finally, so what can you do with this Qt for Python PySide thing, right, you were mentioning? Again, Qt for Python is the kind of like marketing name, but the module is called PySide 6, just as a quick remark. I told you before, there's this nice Tetrix application with, eh, you will say like, yeah, but it's 2024, right? Like, you don't want to do this thing. Uh, but still, I just want to show you because I, I like the video, the, the example, the first time that I saw it. If you like modern local interfaces, this maybe resembles something for you like code or Visual Studio Code. You can also do it with Python. This, in this case, is heavily using a language that we have in the Qt project called QML, which is a declarative language based on ECMAScript, so it feels a little bit like JavaScript or CSS. So if you want to have this thing and create your next text editor, whatever, you can just go clone the repo. You have the example, modify it, and add whatever you want, more modern. If you want to have some nice simulations, maybe you have some little robots or whatever. You can also do these cool things. 
uh, you know, move things around. In this case, of course, you need to develop all the um, design assets, design assets and everything. And then the most important feature here is that you have dark mode, yes. And uh, you can do things like that. And even more advanced, you can do this. Many people don't know, I, so I, I, I don't want to get fired, so I will not say brands, but there is a famous brand, for example, that ends with Esla, that uh, uh, uses Qt for the interface, for example. Uh, there are many other cars, companies, that they use it for their fancy panel things, and it's cute as well. Some people tell me, some, most of the time, but Qt looks really old, I really want to use React or whatever. I mean, if this is old, I don't know, what else are you looking for? But you can get this level of modern kind of feeling in applications. It's only a matter of like having the right tools and everything, the right tools and everything, so yeah, you can do these kind of things as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples. It's a little bit dated, so don't worry about the import. You cannot read na nothing from there, but it's fine because the Christian of the past will fix it for you. So now you can read. So this is a cute C++ application that, as you know, you can easily uh, put a Python interpreter in a C++ application. So in this case, what we are doing is the, this is a real customer case. So they have a huge, uh, cute C++ framework uh, application, and they wanted to give the people the option to write plugins or add-ons in Python. So they include the interpreter there, they put some PySide and Chivoken, as I told you before, and they had the option to, people can easily write a plugin. This, of course, is just an example, and it can do very useful and interesting thing that, in this case, I will change the menu instead of run. It will say run for many use. So this is something that is pe people is using out, out there. For example, if you are familiar with Autodesk Maya, that's the approach that they are using. And again, this example is there. You can clone it and use it and play around with it. So yeah, now it's a, a little bit like all well, these examples, yeah, but there is a, any real business or whatever. Personally, I believe that all the modules like Toga, uh, Beware, uh, with, uh, sorry, Beware, uh, Kiwi, Flat, are really cool and super easy if you want to do something, you know, oh, I want to have a little application that does something simple. Oh, a little application that does something, whatever. But if you really want to do something like for industry, I believe that they are not so feature complete. The amount of integration that they have is nice. For sure, if you write in any example that I showed you before, an example for, uh, wallpaper setter application, use that. But if you want to go the next level, just something for more official in a way, I believe that Qt, in this case PySide, is one of the best options. So just to highlight a few of the industry, at least that we are here, because they're all, this is a sponsor talk. Um, as I told you already, cars, we have many companies using Qt for those cars. Aviation agencies as well, they are using Qt for some interfaces that they have internally. If HMI is your thing, as well, we have lots of cases like that. Uh, medical devices, you know how hard it is to get a certification to have your framework be in, a medi in medical devices? It's super hard. And you can do it with Qt as well. I always tell some people that uh, uh, I think that the dentist that is close to our office uses an application with Qt. So, so at least if you're having missing some bugs, <laughs> then you are you need to fix it, if not your teeth can be broken. But yeah, many things, uh, we have microcontroller support, for example, in, in some cases, so you can have really cool, like smartwatches running with, so far, I don't know any brand that has it, but we do have some examples and demos with them. And the last thing that, of course, as always, you can use it for, desktop application or mobile application. So there are lots of things that are real industry that maybe, I don't know, the coffee machine, but maybe the coffee machine as well, because we do have coffee machines that when you select things and whatever in your companies, they are reading with Qt. So if you're interested, maybe you can drop by the Telegram group. We have a small Telegram group there that people always ask questions or whatever. We have a wiki, the official documentations, or you can always ping me. So with that, I hope that at least you are more interested in C++ and the environment around it and how that is affecting the Python ecosystem in a good way. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, insightful talk. Um, actually, we don't really have much time for Q&A, just one minute, so one question, if someone wants. 
But if you're, if you're quick, you can, we can do both. Uh, yes, thank you. Great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, over the web development, sp uh, speaking of the, web, over the, over the web development, are there plans to do the Python integration with uh, WebAssembly? <laughs> yeah, there have far? been a lot of requests, and I think one of the developers is around and tried to catch me the other day. The, the answer is we want to, yes. The, the, the problem is that it's complicated because of how our build system is uh, configured. If you have solutions or idea or willing to do something, we can talk afterwards, and I can tell you all the details of why it's so difficult to do it at the moment. But yeah, there are some plans. Super, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, how do you actually solve the watch pointer as a special type, Python type, that we just said, this will be a few methods that somehow kind of reflect like the, the, the reference in the pointing, pointer or that thing. But yeah, the implementation is, I can also point you to the source code if you want to see it. But it's just a simple Python type. Cool. Oh. Yeah. Uh, one last story. Uh, through your example and from past experience, it seems like you are putting more efforts into QML than Qt widgets. Yes. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. We, the reason that we are doing that is because we want to separate the front end from the back end of things. And hopefully at some point for you to have your QML thing go around and then, ah, I want to use C++, I want to use Python, whatever, but then the, the front end is they remain the same. This is something that we want to solve by putting emphasis on QML. Because widget is there, it's stable, there are some bugs, but it's, that cannot compete with React and other frameworks in other languages. Okay, but the issue is that licensing is not the same. For, for, the, for what, for QML? Uh, between QML it's the and same, Python. it's the same license. You so have LGPL version three or commercial if you are selling your application. So we can interface QML with PySide? Yes. Use GPL, okay. We can do it now, let's do it now. No, no, no. Okay, uh, cool. Ah, by the way, super important, I forgot. Cool. I have stickers and t-shirts in case you want something. But that's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for, for thank you again and thank you.